your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And uh, I, I really, really appreciated worship today. It was beautiful to see the body flowing together in such unity. It was really a beautiful thing. One person getting a song, another person getting a message, Larry getting the song, and the way it flowed was so beautiful. It's really what we're moving into of the body learning to function together in divine order. And so that's really the focus we have been in for the last three or four weeks. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. And, and if, you know, when, when Paul's writing this, he's talking really about, he's really showing us not only is he addressing a local church in his day, the local Corinthian church, Paul is telling us and giving us a snapshot view into the way church worked in the first century. Very different than the way church has worked for the most part ever since Constantine. You know, right now, most churches work where it's just one or two people doing all of the ministry while everybody else sits in seats or pews and listens as a spectator, as a consumer, to get rather than to contribute and to give. And Paul's telling us here in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, that's not the way it's meant to be. And we want to get back to organic New Testament church. We want to get back to the way church was meant by God, by the Spirit of the Lord. And Paul says to us, what is the outcome? Then, brethren, when you, when you assemble, when you get together, when you, get to, when you come together on Sunday morning, everyone has a psalm, everyone has a teaching, everyone has a revelation, everyone ha- or, or some have a tongue, some have an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Paul's telling us, when you come to church, you're not coming to church to get you're coming to church to give you're not coming to church as a consumer or as a spectator you're coming as a participator you're not coming just to sit in seats you're coming as vital members of the body of Jesus Christ that's the way church is meant to be now of course every leader that makes every leader in the body of Christ incredibly nervous that you're saying you're going to just turn over the service and let anyone share anything, that's where verse 40 comes in. And it's interesting that Paul is writing to perhaps the most carnal church in the New Testament. Paul is writing to a bunch of people who have come out of idolatry. Their lifestyle has been characterized by sexual immorality. They are filled with strife and jealousy and envy. They are, and Paul basically says, you're basically babes in Christ. I can't even give you, I can't give you anything but milk because you're infants. Yet, I mean, it's astonishing to me. This is astonishing that Paul is addressing the most carnal church, perhaps, in the New Testament. And Paul is encouraging the ministry of the body. That, to me, is shocking. That, to me, is like, are you out of your mind, Paul, that you would actually, uh, you know, encourage the body to minister? But he does. But here's what he says, is all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. And so what we've been focusing on for the last three or four weeks or so is a body functioning in divine order is, you know, we want to see, just like we did this, today was such a beautiful thing, just, and last week was such a beautiful thing, just seeing the flowing of unity in the body, and not just one person doing it, but the whole body contributing. It was so beautiful, a body functioning in divine order. Now, one of my concerns, just to be honest with you, one of my concerns as we talk about divine order, one of my concerns is that it would actually have the reverse effect. Instead of releasing more people into ministry, it could have the reverse effect and cause people to shut down to where we get so over-analytical, like, oh, my gosh, am I being like close to Arco Carl? Am I being like Messenger Mitch? Am I, 
You know, am I being like puffed up Patrick or whatever? You know, these different charismania kids we've been talking about, we become so over analytical that we just, you know, overthink it and we shut down. And uh, my heart in this is to see the entire body released and to function uh, based on the gifting, based on the spiritual gifts, based on the way God's anointed you and God has called you. Now, th that's my heart. And, you know, one of the things that is kind of a, a, a joke in our family is when I was a, a little kid, my, my dad would say, cut the grass, and the next thing you know, I had five neighbors from the grass cutting our yard because I would delegate everything. There was a time when I was a, a sophomore in high school, and I got, I got uh, had a lake party, I think, and I got busted, got caught, and I got put on a, a month of restriction, and my dad was like, okay, I'm going to put this boy to work. Next thing you know, I've got four or five of my friends here, and we're doing all this yard work, and we get yard of the month. <laughs> so my point is, I really am a delegator. I want to see, I don't want to, I, I'm just not the type of person that's going to do all the ministry. I want to see the body of Christ fully functioning in divine order. I want to see every member contributing. I want to see every member moving. I want to see every, every member contributing. But again, having done this for 25 plus years, I know it can get very chaotic if there's not divine order. So that's the heart of what this is about. So let's also turn to First Corinth, or, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse, verse 11. Is, is, is don't let this teaching be like a pendulum swing where we go to the other extreme and we shut down. Just This is about learning how to flow in divine order. These are lessons. I mean, none of us learn how to, to move and operate in divine order without training, and, that, and that's kind of what this is about. It's, it's for the release of the, the gifts of the Spirit. Paul is writing, and he's talking about fivefold ministers. He said, he, see, he gave some as apostles, he gave some as prophets, he gave some as evangelists, he gave some as pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. See, everyone in leadership in the body of Christ, one of their man mandates is not to do all the ministry. One of their mandates is not to do all the, the teaching and the ministry and the worship and etc., they are, the, the five-fold leaders are in place to see that the saints are equipped for the work of ministry. But here's what's interesting, is we often think the work of ministry, we think, okay, if a prophet is equipping somebody, he's going to teach them how to prophesy. If an evangelist is equipping them, he's going to teach them how to evangelize. Now, I know there's some truth in that, but I want us to see something from a different angle for a minute. Look again at this verse here. Paul's saying, for, he's saying, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, where it says, to the building up of the body of Christ, that actually in the Greek could be read like this, with a view to the building up of the body of Christ. See, what Paul has in mind here, this is, this is incredible, Paul has in mind the mature man coming forth. I've heard so often in charismatic teaching about the fivefold ministry with zero comprehension of God's eternal purpose to raise up a mature man corporately in the local church that is a reflection of Jesus Christ. It's all about getting people functioning in their gift, getting people functioning in their ministry, but it's all an individual viewpoint. In other words, we equip people to prophesy, so you prophesy with this person and you tell them about their destiny, and you tell them what they're going to do in God, and you tell them how great they are, the problem is there's no view, there's no vision, there's no overriding drive of purpose towards God's eternal purpose. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I have, and I'm not saying that's bad, but what I'm saying is that's not really what Paul's saying here in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul is saying is that with a view to the building up the body of Christ, he's saying the vision of God's eternal purpose, 
to have a mature man, to have the, the, a, a body who has been brought to maturity. With that vision in mind, leaders are called to equip the body to learn how to function in that way so that the local body itself grows up into maturity. Does that make sense? It's not so that you can have your own individual ministry. Very important. This is not about you becoming a prophet or you becoming an apostle or you becoming this or that or you becoming anointed or whatever. This is about God's eternal purpose, the local body becoming into maturity. And I think that's the view we need to see here is that we are equipping the individual members so that Christ, his body, can come into that reflection of him. And so the contributions that we each individual part brings is for the view of the body coming in to full Christ-like maturity according to God's eternal purpose. That we would be conformed into the image of his son. That is what Paul is driving us toward. Not for the releasing so you can have your individual ministry disconnected from the body. See what I'm saying? God is focusing on the corporate. God is focusing on a body coming into full maturity. I'm glad someone said amen. I thought that was good, but um, I'm glad some one person liked that. That's great. Um, I want to read another verse here. This, Paul is telling us, okay, so in Ephesians 4.11, Paul is telling us the fivefold leadership is to equip the body, the, the individual members, so that they can then contribute to the building up of the body, to the building up of the mature man. Now Paul tells us here is how the body grows. He's not talking about numerical growth. He's talking about the image of Jesus Christ. He's talking about spiritual maturity. He's talking about a local body becoming the corporate expression of Jesus Christ and his divine life in a given region. And Paul is telling us, he says, from whom the whole body, it's just talking about growing up, from whom the whole body being fit and held together by what every joint supplies. See, it's every joint that supplies causes the growth. See, if you are keeping your gifts to yourself, you're limiting the body from growing. If you're just coming to consume and be a spectator, the individual body is going to remain immature. And Paul is saying is your contribution, your service, what you contribute as those who have Jesus Christ and have his indwelling life, your the release of the Spirit of God in you is, is causing the body to grow up into his image. That means we have a responsibility not to suppress our gifts, not to suppress our talents, but to release them by the Spirit of God. But he says that according to the proper working of each individual part, it's th that, that word actually means, what this actually means is it means the effectual working of the measure of each individual part. It's connected to Ephesians 4.13, the measure of Christ. Here's what he's saying here. You as an individual member in the body, the measure of Christ you have allowed to live is going to be the measure you can contribute to the body growing up into maturity. If you stay selfish, you're limiting the body. If you, if, you are, if you stay soulish, you're limiting the body. If you allow Christ in you, the indwelling life of Christ in you, to have you fully and you release it, then you're causing the body to grow. And that's what this whole, this whole teaching is about, is we want to see every member of the body... We want to see every member fully functioning, fully releasing the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, fully yielding to the Spirit of God so that Christ and his life comes into fullness. So, 
that is the context for what we have been talking about. And one of the things I did in, 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 in this teaching is, just as a quick review, is I created what I call the Charismania Kids. And, you know, we've been talking about the Charismania Kids, but what I did is I said, okay, 25 years of leading a char- or helping to lead a charismatic church function in the gifts of the Spirit. Here are some lessons that I have learned over 25 years of experience, and I created these different characters that some of them are real, some of them are exaggerated, but the point is to teach us lessons about how to flow in divine order. And we've talked about close talker Carl. He's a close talker. He's right in your face. You can smell his breath. You know what he had for dinner. And close talker Carl was not very self-aware. And I talked about the importance of being self-aware. I talked about the importance of not having a, a, a certain ritual that we are governed by. We talked about puffed up Patrick. Puffed up Patrick is, it has pride, is filled with pride, and doesn't see his need for humility, doesn't see his need for the body, doesn't see the need to honor the body. Then I talked last week about Messenger Mitch. Messenger Mitch, we learned, is that we are, if we are going to speak anything on behalf of God, whether in our families, whether in, our, in the church service, is we want to have a shepherd's heart. We want to have the Lord, who is the, the chief and good shepherd, we want to have his heart so that we speak the truth in love, so that we speak the truth with grace, so that our words actually empower people to live the life of Jesus Christ. And so that's all the, the different ones we've talked about. So now, in your notes, page one, Independent Ivan. And I've noticed that I have been, every name so far has been a man's name. So I feel like I'm like naming hurricanes or something here. But, you know, it's, I'm trying to come up with different names. And I've noticed, okay, you know, every single name I've named so far is Independent Ivan. We're going to talk about Independent Ivan today and Wrong Flow Joe. So next week we're going to have women, okay? So I promise you I'm not trying to pick on the men. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have women. But Independent Ivan he, has, he really has an authentic passion for Jesus Christ. He has this passion for the Lord, and he seeks the Lord in the secret place. He loves Jesus with all of his heart. The problem with Independent Ivan is he's disconnected from what God is doing locally, corporately. So Independent Ivan, you know, it doesn't mean he doesn't know what's going on in the larger body of Christ. Because he listens to every single podcast and every blog and all the YouTube channels and all the different preachers and teachers and prophets and influencers out there. He knows exactly what everyone out there is speaking and saying. And see, Independent Ivan, he thinks he's called to the global body or the church of the city, not to a local church. And I just want to say, Independent Ivan, where did you get that from Scripture? You know, we actually had that one time. Somebody said, well, I'm just called to the church of the city. And I said, okay, show me that in Scripture. <laughs> you, don't, you don't see someone just floating around, hopping from this place to that place, you know, as a church hopper. You see people planted in the local church. See, independent Ivan, really, he, he loves the Lord. He really, really loves the Lord. But his independence causes him to be out of sync with what God is doing locally. And there came a time with Independent Ivan that really became one of those awkward moments because Ivan would always want to share corporately. The problem was with Ivan is he was sharing what God was doing with him. It was not what God was saying corporately. But because Ivan did not have a heart for the corporate, Ivan would always share things that were just not what the Lord was speaking corporately. And so Ivan, it, came, it became this, this thing where Ivan began, and, and we realized Ivan's just becoming an echo of the, of the prophets or the apostles or the ones he's hearing on YouTube or social media. It's not coming out of his own relationship, and it's not benefiting the local. See, sometimes Ivan will deliver a word or a tongues message or pray loud or travail or any of these things, 
But here's the issue is it does not add to the benefit of the corporate. And there came a time a few years ago when independent Ivan got up, the Holy Spirit was really moving. The Holy Spirit was just moving in a really powerful way. And Ivan was stirred up. And the Lord was doing something in Ivan during that meeting. The Lord was stirring up Ivan in that meeting. And Ivan stood up and shared a word for what seemed like 10 minutes. And so, you know, the pastor is listening to Ivan speak. And the pastor is listening to what Ivan is saying. But he realizes, okay, this word is off target. This word is not, first of all, it's not really what God's saying locally. Second of all, it's not really sound. So it got really awkward. The pastor, in love and grace and kindness, because the word was shared publicly, the pastor had to stand up and say, okay, that was a little out of order. You know, because here's the issue, his word had affected the church. His word had affected those who heard. Therefore, the pastor had the responsibility because it affected the corporate, the pastor had the responsibility to share and to correct what had been shared inaccurate. Ivan gets all mad. He storms out. And then he goes hopping from church to church, never, ever being planted in a local church ever again. So here's what we can learn from independent Ivan. Number one, the corporate... I, I feel like I'm like saying this, I'm just a repetition on this, but... I do believe it is what God is wanting to just pound into our heads in a graceful way, of course, is the corporate is greater than you and Jesus. See, we are, we are independent Americans. We think the scriptures were written for us individually, and they were not. They were written for the corporate. They have an individual application for sure, but God wrote them to the church of Ephesus, or God wrote them to the church of Colossae, or the church of Laodicea. God wrote them by the Spirit of God corporately, not just individually. It has individual application. But see, we've got to understand what God is doing corporately is so much greater than what He's wanting to do individually. This me and Jesus lock myself in a prayer closet. I'm going to seek God thinking I'm going to see God's eternal purpose fulfilled or have the fullness of Christ, it's not scriptural. See, we can only see God's purpose fulfilled in the corporate, not merely the individual. This day of Lone Ranger Christianity where I'm just going to go seek the Lord in the prayer closet and just hear Him. Now, I know a lot of people have seen the negativity of the of the institutional church, I realize that. There's a lot of problems with it, but the answer is not just to go lock yourself in a prayer closet and not be connected to the corporate because what God's doing in the corporate, especially when the leadership is wanting to be under the head of Jesus Christ, is so much greater than your own individual ministry and your own individual gifting. See, if God has gifted you, if God has called you into ministry, is not for your ministry, it's not for your gifting. It's not to see that whatever God's gifted you to be expressed. It's to build up the body so the body becomes like Jesus Christ. I'm glad, I'm really glad you're sitting there, Matt. You're making me feel good because all the other people aren't. But, <laughs> yeah, he's like, preach it, brother. I have dealt with independent, you haven't even hardly dealt with independent Ivan. I've dealt with him since I was, you know, 25 years ago, 1991. God has not gifted you, God has not called you to a ministry for your own purposes. If God has given you any gifting, if God has given you any ministry, it's to see the local body built up. It's to see the local expression of the ecclesia come into the fullness of Jesus Christ. It's not for you to build a platform. It's not for you to express your gifting. It's not for you to just, you know... I've got to release what God has said. You know, I remember when we had this one lady, I won't even give her an a alias, but this one lady came in and she, she wanted to express her prophetic gifting so bad. And, you know, she was just always wanting to express it. And we're like, okay, listen, 
okay, we see you, there, there's a gifting, but you need a lot of ministry. You need a lot. And dad's like, which one of those, which of the 20 is that one? But you, you need a lot of training. You need a lot of mentoring. You need to get, see, you're not even focused on the body. You're focused on your own self. You're focused on your gift being used rather than the building up the body. See, we've dealt with independent Ivan quite often. That's why I'm pounding it. The corporate is greater than you and Jesus. Now, I am glad you have you and Jesus. We cannot have the corporate the way it's meant to be without you and Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus in the secret place, you have nothing to contribute or to contribute to the gathering. You have nothing to give if, it's just, if you have no relationship with the Lord. If you have no secret place encounter with Him, no relationship, no personal relationship with Him, then what you're going to add to the meeting is it's just going to be the flesh. It's just going to be the soul. You're going to have no overflow. So... You and Jesus is very important. It just doesn't end with you and Jesus because the corporate is greater than you and Jesus. The corporate is greater than you and your own prayer closet. What you experience and encounter with the Lord in the secret place is meant to be added to the body and the body functioning together as everyone in the body adds to what their relationship with the Lord is in the overflow, then we have the building up of the body. Thanks. That's, yeah, appreciate that. Number two is we want to seek to build up the local body. Very important. We want a heart that wants to see the local body built up. If that's in our heart, then it'll make it so much easier for us to be able to distinguish what is for me and what is for the church. See, what I've seen a lot of times is that people will get words, but and it's true words, but it's never, it, there's no application, there's no building up of the corporate, and that just doesn't even need to be shared. And that happens all the time, where the Lord will speak to you about something, and you know, back in my early days, is anytime God ever spoke anything to me, I was so excited that I would get up immediately and share, and the Lord's like, that's not intended for the the church is just for you. I had to learn that, okay, is this expression of the Spirit of God, is what God is speaking to me, is this prophecy, is this tongue, is this prayer, whatever, is it really adding value to the body? Is it profiting the body? Is it, is it causing the body to grow? And if it's, if it's only a word for me, now it can be a word for me, but that word for me can also be a blessing to everyone else. And so in that case, the Lord's like, yeah, it's for you, but share it because it will bless everybody else. There's other times when it's just God speaking something to you that's not meant to be shared corporately. And so we've got to learn to train, okay, Lord, is this meant to be shared corporately or is this just for me? Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Paul's talking about this and and again, this, this could apply to a, a prophecy, it could apply to a prayer, it could apply to travail, a tongues message, a song, any kind of corporate, anything, see, anything we're going to share in a way that affects the corporate where everyone can hear us and it becomes, you know, we're now speaking it out. This, would, this principle is what is applying, is Paul saying in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. God does not give you spiritual gifts for your own good. See, we got to understand this. There is a high that can come when God speaks something to you and you get excited there's something that is even more exciting when you share it and people go, wow, that word really blessed me. 
and then you get the attention drawn to yourself. See, is what God is, is, is what God doing benefiting the common good, or is it just for you? See, we got to say, I mean, are you ministering? Are you sharing? Are you doing this for yourself so you have, so you feel important, so you feel anointed, so you feel recognized, so your gift is seen by others and they begin to go, wow, you have such a gift. You are so anointed. You have such an insider revelation. See, we, we're getting to this selfish ambition here. It, it, and I'm, that lady I was referring to from, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15, I don't know. She wanted to be recognized for her gifting. And so everything she would share was so that people would go, wow, what insight. Wow, what revelation. Wow, you have such a deep, intimate walk with the Lord. It was driven by her own selfish ambition and not for the common good of the body. If God is giving you a gift, if God is giving you a manifestation of the Spirit, it might be for you personally, but, it, but if it is, then it's to be kept to yourself. If it's not, then you are to share it for the common good. Now, on the other side, if God is wanting you to speak something corporately and you keep it to yourself, you actually cause the others in the body not to benefit because you have buried what God has said out of fear, out of a fear of being wrong out of a fear of rejection or, you know, I'm just like, I'm so nervous that this is right. See, when God's moving, if you don't release what God's saying, you actually can inhibit the flow of the Spirit for that particular Sunday. It's just a matter of training. It's a matter of learning. Now, let's, let's flip over to 1 Corinthians 14, 6. I want you to see the, the, the heart of Paul. Let, let's, let's, get, let's get the heart of Paul here for a second. As we read this, just receive the heart of Paul. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Here's the key. Paul's heart was to profit. Paul's heart was to take the body and build it up. Paul's heart was to see that local ecclesia become like Jesus Christ in fullness. And so what I am adding to a service, a song, a word, a teaching, a revelation, am I contributing to the building up of the local ecclesia, profiting the local ecclesia, or is it for me? And so whenever you want to share anything publicly, it's always, always good to say, okay, is this the right expression of the Spirit for the right moment? And, and down in verse 28, Paul says, talking about tongues, he said, if there's not an interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. And the, the point, this could apply to any one of the manifestations of the Spirit of God. If I'm getting a revelation, if I'm getting a gift, if I'm getting a word of knowledge, if I'm getting this or a word of wisdom, or if God is speaking to me, we've got to say, okay, does this profit the local body at this time? God might be giving you something for three months from now. Is the expression of the Spirit of God that you are receiving the right expression for the right moment and the right mood? And see, what Paul is saying, you've got to learn how to distinguish when you need to share it and if you need to share it, how you need to express it. Because if it's not benefiting the whole corporate body, then Paul's saying here, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. Anything we share publicly should benefit the whole building up of the corporate. Number three, let's, let's turn to Psalms 92. Number three, being planted, another lesson, the third lesson, 
is that being planted in a local church results in spiritual growth. Uh, I've seen this <laughs> so often. Conference hoppers. I mean, if you're here, you're probably because you're here because you believe like I do. But, you know, conference hoppers going from this place to that place, this man of God to that man of God. I mean, when I first got into the Lord over 20 years ago, I had to go to every conference. I had to go to every single thing that was going on in the city. I just was like, if I don't not hear what this person comes to town, I'm going to miss the Lord. And I mean, I was like wearing myself out, traveling all over the place, going all over the place. Now, that, I mean, part of it was good. God was, I had a hunger, which was great. But part of it was, you know, and God was training me, so, you know, the Lord blessed it. But, you know, I've seen so many people that just want to go from this place to that place to this place to that place. The grass is greener on this over here. Here's what we, I've just seen it. The, the way to growth is by being planted in a local church. If you really care about your own spiritual growth, you will be planted in a local church. You are not going to grow being transplanted from one place to another, here, there, and everywhere. Psalms 92, that was independent Ivan. The, you know, the first time conflict came into his life, the first time he was challenged a little bit, independent Ivan said, I'm out of here. See, what God could have done with independent Ivan, God could have really taught him and, and trained him, but independent Ivan was unteachable. He's just like, hey, you don't receive my gift, I'm out of here. I'm out to that place over here. Well, they will receive me. Well, you'll find out you're going to experience the very same thing you just experienced here because the problem is not there or here. The problem is in you. That's the issue, Ivan. The issue, Ivan, is you internally don't know how to be, be, uh, be a blessing to the corporate. The issue is not the grass is greener here. The issue is you in your heart, Ivan. I might, I might get an added inheritance with this message with that. He's like, the righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of God. Growth, I've seen this so often, growth comes by being planted, not by being transplanted. I've seen those that go from church to church and place to place, this move of God, that move of God, chasing the next revival or the next word or the next prophet or the next apostle, the next new thing God's going to do. I look at their lives, 30 years being saved, and they're still in spiritual diapers. And it's really sad. You know, have you ever seen those grown-ups that wear diapers? I mean, it's like a lot of the church is in spiritual diapers because we hop from church to church and place to place and are never planted and I never allow our roots to grow down and I never allow uh, us to develop a heart to serve the local church, the local ecclesia, not coming to so my gift can be recognized, not coming because I can have my ministry, not coming so I can be you know, recognized by this leader or that leader, but coming truly with a servant's heart to want to serve. The Lord told a parable, he said, he said how, you know, if you're not faithful with the use of someone's, of that which is another, how are you going to be faithful with your own thing? I learned this, probably the, probably the greatest thing, one of the greatest things I ever learned was serving dad in ministry. It's just God, you know, the Lord spoke to me in the mid-90s and said, to, to a couple of prophetic voices, you're called to serve your dad in ministry. I didn't do it perfect, far from it, but I wish I could go back over and do it better. But I learned an incredible lesson. All ministry comes out of serving. There is no such thing as an Elisha if he doesn't serve the Elijah. There is no receiving of a mantle if there's not serving someone else. There, and I don't mean just, I'm not talking about like this crazy stuff of worshiping leaders, but I'm talking about serving in the local church with no agenda, 
you know, no, I'm coming to do this so they'll allow me to minister. None of that coming with a true servant's heart to say, I want to bless this local body so this body can become a reflection of Jesus Christ. The fourth thing, 1 Corinthians 14.29 says, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. Wait, I didn't think we were called to judge anyone as Christians. Don't judge. You know, we're told. You're not supposed to judge. Wait, I didn't think we're supposed to judge. I believe, having been in the prophetic movement for over 20 years, 25 years, however, what the number is, I believe one of the greatest weaknesses in the prophetic movement this day is we don't honor and obey the Scripture. We don't pass judgment on prophetic words. We just allow anything to say, anyone to say anything, and we've created this, like, crazy view, this crazy view of God. Multiple personality disorder. You know, God one day is saying this, and the next day he's saying something completely different. We haven't judged prophetically. We haven't judged prophetic words accurately. Now, there is a way to judge prophetic words with love, with grace, and with kindness. We don't have to be rude about it. We don't have to be embarrassing about it. But if we're going to say, and it all, you know, again, if, if we're going to, if we're going to say, say the Lord said something, we need to judge it. Don't we? Amen? You need to judge what I say. Say, don't just say because, you know, he's the leader and he said it. That it's the Lord. Any leader. Dad, anyone. I mean, anyone in the body of Christ. We need to, I'm not talking about having a religious spirit or a critical spirit that tries to quench the spirit of God. I'm talking about really before the Lord judging the words that people are saying God's speaking. We need to, to really assess, okay, is this the Lord? Now, there's a lot of circumstances in judging that, you know, I won't get into that right now, but my point is we need to judge the prophetic words. Now, Ivan, the issue with Ivan is Ivan stood up and shared what he thought was a prophetic word, but it was an error. So the elders can't just sit there while everyone hears error and not say anything because the elders are responsible for the sheep, the church. And so it would be very irresponsible for, a, I mean, if, a, if, a, if someone stood up and, sh, and, and said something corporately that was an error and the pastors didn't say anything and didn't correct that, then it would be not good leadership. Because people hearing this would think, okay, he must think it's right. You know, he, so it sends people into confusion. So we want to, you know, and again, this, this is not, I know, hearing something like that is like, I'm never going to speak anything. I don't want to say anything wrong or be corrected publicly. I don't think I've ever corrected anyone publicly yet. So that's like the last thing I'd ever want to do, right? So the safeguard, if you're going to share anything directional or anything, any kind of word, the safeguard is just to share it and review it with an elder. That's the safest thing. That way people, we, can, we can judge it before it's shared corporately, and that way we don't have to get to this place where we have to correct something publicly. No one wants to correct that. I don't want to correct anyone publicly. That's just awkward. You don't want to be corrected publicly. That's not really the heart of this. 
So the, the best thing to do, if you, if you, when the Lord is giving you a word, now, this doesn't really apply to, like, if you're singing a song or, you know, saying amen or reading a song, but if you're going to share a word that you believe God is speaking or you believe God is saying that can direct or lead a congregation, then, it, like, if, I just, if someone just got up and said, okay, I believe the Lord's saying this, this, and this, and it was wrong, but, he said, but the person said it corporately, then the leadership has a responsibility for those who heard to bring the correction and say that particular word was not accurate. And that's just awkward for everybody. I mean, no one wants to do that. The best thing is just take the word, share it with the elder, an elder, let the elders review it and assess it and see, okay, well, this is, this is the Lord, this is not the Lord. Okay, this is the Lord, but not for now. This is the Lord for now. All that kind of stuff. Not that the elders have perfect timing on everything. I don't mean that. But th there is victory in the multitude of counsel. There, you know, as we can get together and share those things, it really helps everyone. So, anyway, anything that is expressed corporately is subject to public correction. All right? So... That would be hopefully a very, and like I said, I don't know if I've ever corrected anyone publicly. So that would be a very, very, very rare case. But there is a responsibility. That's the thing I want to hit on. We, in sharing a word from the Lord, we are directing and influencing God's children. The teacher has, a, that's why the teacher has a stricter judgment. That's why the elders have a stricter judgment is because they are influencing God's people. So when you share a word, we are, we are influencing the body. So there is, there, there, is, there, there, is a, there is a fear of God in this. It doesn't, don't let the fear of God be, make you afraid, all right? Big difference. We need to fear God. We don't need to be afraid of being wrong. Catch that? We need to fear God. We don't need to be afraid of being wrong. It's a big difference, all right? So make, that, make sure you understand that because the fear of God will cause us to, to really judge the word, assess the word, share with elders. But it will also lead us to share the word, whereas we're, if, we're, we're, if we are afraid of being wrong, we'll keep the word to ourselves out of fear. So... There is a responsibility. That's, that's the thing I want to stress. Whenever we're going to express anything corporately, we carry a responsibility in whatever we share corporately. There's a responsibility we carry. Okay, moving on. And I was so glad today in the corporate service that there was no wrong flow because we're going to talk about wrong flow Joe. Wrong flow Joe. Again, wrong flow Joe, his brother is independent Ivan. They're, they're one of the same. They're, he loves the Lord. He seeks the Lord secret, uh, in the secret place. He, wrong flow Joe, here's the issue with wrong flow Joe. Every time he shares something publicly, it's out of sync with what God is saying. There was a time a few years ago when the pastor was prompted by the Holy Spirit, and he stood up and he said, I believe from Hosea 3.5 that the, the Lord is going to reveal his goodness and that the people are going to come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. If you have anything to share related to God's goodness, then, you know, let's, let's start sharing about God's goodness. And so, you know, one person shared about God's goodness, another person shared about God's goodness, and that inspired someone in the congregation to start singing, God, you're so good. Then the worship team started to sing a different version of that. The Spirit of God came so powerfully into the service. People were crying and tears were flowing. Depression was breaking off. Yokes were being destroyed and false images of, of who God was was coming down. People were saying, God is so good. The anointing was so powerful until Wrong Flow Joe stood up and said, I've got a word. The Lord spoke to me during worship out of Revelation chapter 6. So the seven sealed judgments are going to be released. Jesus is coming back soon. We've got to prepare the world because half the world's population is going to die. Immediately, the Holy Spirit was quenched. Now, what Wrong Flow Joe said was true. 
That's true. That's the scriptures. Wrong flow Joe was just out of sync with the expression of the mood of the Holy Spirit for that time and that season. See, I mean, what wrong flow Joe said was absolutely scripturally true, but wrong flow Joe was just out of sync. So here's some lessons we can learn from wrong flow Joe. Is we want to make sure that we have the right expression in the right mood at the right moment. See, if the mood of the Holy Spirit is somber, serious, and holy, it would be inappropriate for someone to get up and say, Hey, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Likewise, if the Lord is moving and showing His goodness like wrong flow Joe, it would be inappropriate at that time to say, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, we, the, the, the Holy Spirit has a, a mood. The Holy Spirit has an agenda for each gathering. We want to tap into that mood of the Holy Spirit for that corporate gathering and express what the Lord is speaking corporately for that and to flow in the mood for that moment. So we want to ask ourselves, page four, point B, uh, one of the bullet points there. Uh, ask yourself, is this, the, when you're getting something, when you're getting a, an impression or word or moving, the Lord's moving on you, is this the right expression at the right moment? Am I being overly loud or too quiet? Is what I'm expressing affecting those around me um, or how is it? Um, is my expression beneficial to the body? Or am I being disruptive? Is what I'm saying or doing drawing attention to myself or building up the body? See, we want to be, we want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and what the Holy Spirit is doing corporately. We don't want to be like wrong flow Joe who's always out of sync with the corporate expression of the Spirit. We don't want to zone out into me and Jesus mode. Well, we're, and I, I appreciate that, but we want to also... Be focused on, okay, Lord, what are you doing and what are you saying among the corporate? Number two is we want to be sensitive to the person who is leading the gathering. See, in every this could apply to a prayer meeting. It could apply to a corporate uh, service. It could apply to a home group. But in every place there is a leader, and all the leaders are going to be facilitators. They're not... No one leading is going to be controlling or no one leading is going to say, you know, dominating and this is the way it's going to be. It's, we're, 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 as leaders, we are facilitators. We're trying to facilitate the move of the Holy Spirit. We're trying to facilitate the moving of the body, the expression of the body. And so it, it, it's really like, like Dad facilitating today, you know, as he was moving and sharing about, you know, the deliverance and, the, you know, Psalms 103 and stuff like that. We want, to, we want to be sensitive to what we feel like God has spoken and say, okay, you know, at this thing I'm sen sensing, I believe, is the Lord, but I don't really believe it fits with the direction the leader is moving in right now. But, you know, at the same time, I would still share it with an elder because that, you know, God could move and shift in a service. So it's always important to share. Don't just bury it. So always share what you're getting. Don't, don't hide or bury what you feel like God is saying, share it with an elder to evaluate and to assess, but be sensitive, okay? How is the Lord moving corporately? How is the leader moving, and what is he sensing? And kind of flow in that. God will, what I've seen is if we flow with the leader and flow with the person facilitating, and again, in prayer meetings, you know, so many times I've been in prayer meetings where, you know, one person's praying, you know, let's just pick a topic. We're praying for abortion, the ending of abortion, and then someone in a prayer meeting has zoned out, probably me, because I do that a lot in prayer meetings. I'll just use myself because I'm guilty. They're praying for abortion. I zone out and start thinking about this other thing. And then, you know, I've done this with mom is, or Angie as well. I zone out, and then the next thing I do is I repeat their same prayer. And they're like, yeah, I just prayed that like five minutes ago. So <laughs> my point is, don't be like me. Be like Mom and Angie. But my point is, be sensitive to the leader leading your group and flow in the direction the Lord is leading the corporate. 
Number three, th- this, is, this is a big one. This is something we want to get better at, is learn to feed off one another. When Paul was talking about, in 1 Corinthians 14, about the gifts of the Spirit, he says, you may all prophesy one by one. See, what was happening is the prophetic, when it starts moving and the Spirit starts moving, what happens if you will pay attention to what the Lord is speaking, God, you may not have anything, you may not have any sensing, but immediately when someone starts sharing a word, it activates something in you. That's the, that's the way the body works. That's the way the body is intended to work. So, you know, like even today, when God was, you know, the Lord was moving in Psalms 103 and God was moving in His goodness, you know, that, listen to that because that can trigger a scripture. That can trigger a word. That can trigger a prophecy. That can trigger a prayer. We want to feed off one another. That can trigger a song. You know, the, you know Larry singing, uh, Lord, the, the, I love you, Lord. That triggers a song. The worship team, then listen, you know, listen to that song. Maybe that Lord will lead you. You know, that might lead someone else in the congregation. Just learn to feed off one another. Learn to feed off one another. See, it's so easy, all of us, it's, all, it's very easy for us in the corporate gathering to lose focus of what the Lord is doing and saying corporately where we zone out into me and Jesus mode. Hopefully it's not me and football mode or me and shopping mode or me and what's for lunch mode. We zone out. I want to encourage you, don't zone out. Pay attention to what the Lord is saying corporately and feed off of it. Be inspired by it. Let the Lord trigger a prophecy. Let the word trigger something in you by what someone else says. Learn to, that's how the body moves. That's how the body functions. That's how our body functions. See, the command comes from the head to move to the arm, and the arm moves and the fingers move, and all that, that coordination that's the way the body is meant to function in the local gathering of the, the church, is we feed off one another. And so as we bring this message to a close, next week I'm going to hopefully talk about not shrinking back with your gift, not being a timid, I haven't named the name yet, don't being timid about it, not having a spirit of fear, not bearing your talent, but, you know, learn these lessons. Go back and study this. Learn. This is all learning for us. We're learning how to move in divine order. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you, Father, that, Lord, you are so good. Lord, I, I really do love what you're doing here, Lord. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the past few services where more and more of the body has begun to uh, add to, to, to the meeting and uh, bring a gift, bring a word, bring a tongue, Lord, bring a revelation, bring a song. Lord, I want to pray that, Lord, we would be a body functioning in divine order. Lord, we would be a body that would really learn how to flow from the head, Jesus Christ. Lord, we, I just pray that you would teach us, Lord. I want to ask you, Lord, there would be a spirit of revelation, a spirit of wisdom. We're all learning. This is all learning. Every one of us are learning how to flow together. I ask you, Lord, that you would teach us by the Holy Spirit how to flow together. I I believe with all my heart that this end-time move of the Holy Spirit is not going to come by one or two anointed vessels. It's going to come by the body and a body functioning in divine order. Lord, I I just ask you right now that you would train us, you would teach us, you would equip us, Lord. You would just instruct us, Lord, I pray, how to flow in divine order that we could see the building up of the body of Jesus Christ. We just say we love you, Lord, and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well.